Hi, it's Brendan here. Before we kick off with this week's podcast, I have a very special announcement to make. I am really happy to be able to tell you that my new book is being published on the 5th of June. It's called A Heretic's Manifesto, and it is basically a blast against the conformism of our time. It covers everything from gender ideology to COVID authoritarianism to climate change hysteria, and it makes the case for having a bit more heretical thinking. It's a rallying cry for heretics. It's a rallying cry for freedom of thought, and I really think you're going to like it. You can pre-order it right now on Amazon UK or Amazon US, so do that straight away. We've also got a very special offer. Anyone who donates £50 or more to Spite will get a signed copy of the book while stocks last. To do that, go to spiked-online.com slash donate. Plus, if you're a Spike supporter, you can attend the online launch of the book on Monday the 5th of June. Andrew Doyle will be interviewing me about the book and taking your questions too. So Spike supporters can sign up for that book launch right now by going to the supporters hub on Spiked. So whether you are pre-ordering the book on Amazon or donating in order to get a signed copy, don't delay. Go out and get your copy of A Heretic's Manifesto now. Thank you so much. I really hope you enjoy the book. And now on with the show. Hello, welcome back to the Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill, and my special guest this week, Susan Nyman. Susan, welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here. It's great to have you on, and I want to talk to you primarily about your new book, which is called Left Is Not Woke, which might just be one of my favourite book titles of recent years. I think the world has been waiting for a book explaining why what is referred to as wokeness or what is conceived of as wokeness is not left-wing, as some of us would have traditionally understood left-wing to mean. Um, so I'm very interested in the ideas that you put forward in the book and and in your takedown of woke. It seemed like a book that needed to be written, which is why I you know, threw away my plans to take a break last summer <laughs> and then wrote it. Well, I'm, I'm very glad you did that, and I'm sure lots of readers of the book will be too. Um So where to start? I think probably the best place to start is by asking you to do something that I get asked all the time, and I do struggle a little bit, which is to define what we mean by woke. So you touch on the fact in in your book and in the things you've written, we all know what woke used to mean. It's a term that comes largely from the African-American community in the United States. It means being aware to social injustice, stay woke, stay awake, stay alert is basically what it meant. But it's obviously become much more pejorative in recent years. I use it all the time. I probably overuse it to describe a culture that I understand and feel is problematic, but I'm I'm conscious of the fact that people don't instantly recognize what we're talking about all the time. So just to kick off, how do you see woke? When you hear that word, what are you thinking about? Well, when I first heard the word, I thought it was a great word. And what's wrong, as you've put it, with being awake to social injustice and trying to do something about it. But as the you know few years have gone by, um, I've come to think that it's a, a movement or a trend which indeed appeals to and is driven by emotions, which were traditional to the left, concern for people who are marginalized and a determination to root out injustice. Um, a desire to correct or, or at least to acknowledge the uh, historical injustices. So all of that, I think, is quite confusing to those of us who are on the left. But what then has happened, it seems to me, is that it's fueled by a bunch of theoretical assumptions that are actually quite reactionary and have not been part of the traditional left at all. I deliberately, in writing this book, did not want to write another litany of woke excess. I could have done that very easily, and there's some books on the market that do it. The only time I use the word cancel culture is in the very first sentence, which says this is not a book about cancel culture. Okay, What I try to do in this book is to look at the theoretical, philosophical assumptions that are behind those excesses. And 
it should be said, I do talk a lot about philosophy. This is a book about for the general reader. And even for those woke activists who have never read a word of Michel Foucault or Carl Schmitt, those are assumptions that have gotten into the general culture. And I did provide a few examples of, you know, mainstream media that thoughtlessly has taken over ideas like we are fundamentally determined by what tribe we were born into. And that has become, uh, you know, you see that in, you know, very standard mainstream publications like the New York Times all the time or The Guardian or, um, you, you know, in, in other countries as well. And that is anathema to what it's always meant to be on the left. Uh, that was traditionally a very right-wing view, the idea that you're only really going to deeply connect with somebody from your tribe, and you therefore only have real obligations to people within your tribe. Um, whereas the left-wing standpoint was, you know, our tribe can encompass the whole world. These are not um, these. They're not determining identities. Of course, we're affected by uh, the culture we grew up in and the histories of our ancestors, but they don't determine us, okay? Yeah. Um, so that's one uh, way in which I feel the that the woke has diverged from the left. Another is in the confusion between justice and power. And once again, let's go back to the days before the, let's say, the liberal left began during the Enlightenment. Um, if a peasant stole a prince's deer, he could be hanged. And that was simply the way the world is, because you didn't have the idea that there was one law that applied to everyone just in virtue of their being human. Um, if the prince took the peasant's daughter, you know, that was also part of the way the world was. We failed to appreciate how radical that position is because we've been living with it for a good two or 300 years. Of course, it gets violated. I mean, we know, you know, plenty of instances in which justice gets confused with power or indeed when power claims uh, are disguised by claims about justice. I think the uh, Iraq war is a great example. Um, and it's, it's still amusing that there are Europeans who really believe that uh, the U.S. went to war in Iraq because they wanted to establish democracy, where those of us who were looking a little more closely <laughs> saw this was actually not what they were doing mm -hmm. at all. Um, but uh, the theorists who the the woke read and depend on are people like Foucault, like Schmidt, who don't recognize a real distinction between justice and power. They think it's all hype. And the third way in which I think that the woke diverges from the left is its um, despair, really, or cynicism, depending on the mood, about the possibility of making progress. Now, it's certainly true that there are people, you know, people who are woke activists want to make progress. But if you don't actually acknowledge that progress has been made in the past, if you say things like, you know, we're just as racist as we were 50 years ago or 100 years ago, or the patriarchy has, you know, ruined women's lives forever and any improvement is is basically just a sham. And from you hear people saying things like that all the time, um, then you're not going to believe that human beings working together can actually make progress. I hope that's a decent definition of the distinction between woke and left. I mean, um, many of us, and this was um, the reason that I wrote the book, many of us spend time over coffee, over beer, late at night, uh, telling stories of one piece of woke excess for another. Um, and we could spend the entire conversation doing <laughs> that. But it, it didn't seem fruitful to me. It seemed much more important right now to get uh, behind the ideas that are fueling woke excess. Yeah. And it's like in the 80s, people used to have discussions all the time about political correctness gone mad. And they would pick the most extreme examples like 
you know, bar bar black sheep being banned in schools because it's racist. And and what they should have been doing, of course, is looking at the cultural and political shifts that underpinned some of these changes that were referred to as political correctness. And I think that you're right, there is a similar danger in relation to wokeness where we sit around uh, lamenting the extreme manifestations of it rather than thinking about the phil- philosophical underpinnings of the shift that has taken place on the left. I think what's really valuable about your book you, you say there that it's a philosophical book, and it is. You are, of course, a world-renowned moral philosopher. That's an important thing for people to bear in mind. The book is also incredibly accessible and very readable. And I think it's it's brilliant both for someone who wants an introduction to what wokeness means and also who wants someone who wants a deeper understanding of some of the trends and developments behind it. You've just given an outline there of what are essentially the three blocks in your book. So uh, the shift from universalism to tribalism amongst the left, their confusions over justice and power and how they, they're they really wrong on that, and also their cynicism, their doom-mongering, their, their sense of fatalism. Those are your three ways in which you explain that what is currently looked upon as woke is not left as it would traditionally have been understood. That's very useful because I want to ask you about all three of those and just get a bit more of a sense of of why you thought they were important. So let's kick off with the universalism stuff. You you really do focus a lot on the universalism question at, at, at the start of the book. And it is very striking that there has been this shift on the left from universalism to particularism, from the idea that we might be bound by our beliefs or our convictions to this idea that we're more bound by our cultural heritage or our skin color or or our gender or our sex. I remember I was on BBC TV here with uh, Robin D'Angelo, the author of White Fragility. And she was talking about, you know, she and I as white people and why we could never understand black people. And I was saying, but, you know, the arguments that were traditionally made by progressives is that whites and blacks could absolutely bind together over class politics, over workplace struggles, over a view of society that might be better than the one we currently live in. And it seemed so alien to her that I was saying these things that go beyond skin colour. So just explain to us why you think that's important. Well, the interesting thing with Robin D'Angelo, of course, um, in the 19th century, neither the Irish nor the Jews nor the Italians were considered to be white. Yeah. So these are really very fluid categories. I mean, yeah. that's that's one problem with that kind of essentialism. Um, What's increasingly been clear to me is that uh, the problem with woke identitarianism, which is really, you know, just the mirror image, frankly, of white identitarianism, um, is the reduction of the many identities that we all have um, to two. And I think anybody who thinks about this for a minute will realize that they have a whole bunch of identities that are incredibly important to them, but at different times. I mean, I don't even always, I am a woman. I've never considered myself um, anything other than a woman, but it's only in certain situations that that's been, you know, that's the identity that I focus on. I'm also a mother, Um, you know, which when my kids were little was a, primary component of Mm. my identity, less so now. People identify deeply with their political convictions, um, sometimes with their professions, um, with all kinds of things. But what we're now told to do is to reduce all of these complex and sometimes shifting identities to two, and they're actually the two that we have the least control over. Um, and the ones that are, you know, therefore not a product of agency. They're not identities that we choose. They're identities that are forced onto us at birth. Um, you know, complicate, let's, let's leave the question of, of gender, you know, whether gender is forced on you at birth or not. It's for most people, it is for some people, it's not. Um, and in so doing, um, it takes agency and choice out of the equation of who we are. But, you know, the, the tendency of people now among the woke to make an argument by saying, I as a woman, you know, I as a black man, I as a queer person, um, it, you know, 
as if that were all the I was. Mm. And, you know, that serves instead of an argument. And it's a very troubling development. I, I think that's that's right. And I sometimes have the same instinct as you to wish that things were a bit more individualist in the traditional liberal rugged individual sense, even though I am not necessarily an individualist politically speaking. But because one thing I found is that in left-wing identitarian politics, there's often a, an unconfident contingent uh, declaration of identity. So if you look at the phrase, I identify as, for example, whereas in the past, people would have said, I am, I am a shoemaker, I am a Roman Catholic, I am a woman. There was a, a, a sense of confidence, a sense of being in the world, present in the world, relating to other people, whereas now it's much more, I identify as, and sometimes it's, I identify as this for now, but I don't quite know what I'm going to be in six weeks' time. My gender might change. My race might change if you're Rachel Dolezal, for example. Identity politics can seem quite strident and sometimes even quite unforgiving. And that's where I do think cancel culture comes into it. They want to wipe aside uh, certain forms of criticism. But that stridency disguises a, a crisis of identity. So you go looking for other ones and sometimes just inventing them from pure cloth or, or relying upon your given natural identity rather than one that you foster yourself in a meaningful way. I think that's a very good point, and you're pointing to a contradiction because um, it goes both ways. It's, um, it's often a quite incoherent um, standpoint to identity. On the one hand, your identity is fixed, and so Rachel Dolezal, um, because she wasn't born black, even though um, you know she grew up around a largely black family and identified that way, um, you know, was, was hounded out of her job because she was, you know, not conforming to this absolutely essentialist identity. Um, whereas, you know, we have the whole transgender debate, which, you, you know, if, if you can decide that you're, you're born gender identity is not your real one. Um, and anyone who even raises questions about that is, um, you know, transphobic. Um, it seems that it ought to, you know, cases like Rachel Dolezal's, and there've been a couple of other ones, you know, ought to be greeted with at least a little more ambiguity uh, and ambivalence than they were. So I think you're pointing to a real contradiction on the other hand, um, we have cases of people who are uncertain about their identity and want the freedom uh, to acknowledge it, or rather to change their birth-given identity. But in other cases, you know, what you are at birth essentially determines uh, your entire set of attitudes towards the world. And people who, um, you know, I, I certainly have friends of color who don't feel that their entire identity is being determined by their skin color and the way that they might be perceived on the street and do not want to take part in uh, Robin DiAngelo's style anti-racism. Um, and they then, it's really quite interesting, they get called black conservatives, um, even though their politics might I, mean, I don't think their politics are conservative at all. It's, you know, quite, you know, runs the gamut. And the, some of the people I'm thinking of from, you know, left-leaning liberal to socialist. But um, if they break now with the race, what's considered to be correct racial politics, um, they're stamped as conservative. And, I, I mean, look, I, uh, I have friends um, these were both white friends who told me, uh, you know, before I published the book, for God's sake, don't write a book with the word woke in the title. It will be used by the right. And, you know, I, I, I kind of agree with your arguments, but you will be giving aid and comfort to Ron DeSantis or Rishi Sunak or whoever um, uses woke as uh, as a way to... Uh, attack any attempt to come up with, you know, 
different ways of looking at history, different ways of seeking uh, racial or gender justice. And I thought about it. I, I looked for other titles, and then I decided, no, actually, I'm I'm staying with this. This is um, we all we all know what we're talking about. Uh, so far, I have not been instrumentalized by the right. The the worst I've seen is a is a comment on a on a right wing blog saying something like. Well, you have to wade through a lot of leftist bullshit to get there, but she does have a few good ideas. <laughs> this is not actually actually being instrumentalized. Hello, everyone. It's Tom Slater here, editor of Spiked. I just want to let you all know about some very exciting new additions to the Spiked website, and that is our newly relaunched and revamped donor community, where people who donate to us monthly or annually get to access all kinds of exclusive perks, including a couple brand new ones that we've just introduced. So as many of you will know, Spiked is completely free. All of our articles, our videos, our podcasts, uh, because we want anyone anywhere to be able to read us, to watch us, to listen to us, to hear our arguments. But in order to keep Spiked free and fearless and independent, with no paywall in our way or corporate paymasters to answer to. We rely on our generous readers, people who think the media is a much better place with Spiked in it, to donate regularly to fund our work. And as a small token of our gratitude, we have our fabulous online donor community where you can access all kinds of brilliant benefits, which as I say, we've got some great new additions to tell you about. So now for as little as five pounds per month, you can read Spiked completely ad free, as well as access the comment section, get invites to online events, get discounts in the shop and much more. We also have a higher tier now where donors can access exclusive in-person events and dinners with the Spike team, as well as get a free signed copy of every Spike book that we bring out and there's much else besides. So if you're not already a Spike donor or a Spike supporter, now is the perfect time to become one. To find out more and to sign up, just go to spiked-online.com forward slash support. That's spiked hyphen online.com forward slash support. Thank you so much. We really wouldn't be here without you. And now back to Brendan. Yeah, I think they'll have a tough time instrumentalizing you and instrumentalizing this book because it is, I would say, a left wing book. And I, I wanted to ask you uh, about that. And I wanted to ask you to what extent you think the rise of identitarianism on the left or tribalism, as you also refer to it, to what extent do you think it's a a product of the crisis of class politics? Because of course, class was one of the key ways through which working people in particular expressed a, 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 a post particularist sense of solidarity. This was a, it was a form of universalism as a form of um, community and coming together that rose above how you were born, how you looked, what sex you were, what class you were. Now, it wasn't always smooth sailing, and there were still tensions that arose within different groups in society, ethnic tensions and so on. Um, but class was basically seen as a means through which people could come together despite what might separate them in terms of their race, their national heritage, their sex, their gender. Uh, so do you think the, it's it's the decline of class politics and class consciousness that is the foundation stone for some of this stuff? And might that also be why the corporate world seems to me to be incredibly comfortable with um, wokeness and identity politics and it, it, the amount of money they pay to people like Rob and D'Angelo to come in and essentially reprimand the workforce and split them into black and white? It, it, do you think that it, it's it's a crisis of class that lays the seeds for this? Yeah, so yes and no. Um, let me say that I uh, consider myself a socialist or, you know, if you want to make it easier on yourself, you can say social democrat. But I, I, I do use the word socialist just because I'd like to make that word sayable again. Um, but I'm not a Marxist, and I'm not a Marxist, although I've, you know, of course, learned a lot from Marx and Marxist thinkers, uh, because I'm not a class reductionist either. Um, you know, it worked. It's a theory that worked better for the 19th century, although even then, you know, many of the best, you know, most committed, most um, 
effective socialists didn't actually come from the working class. And that, you know, of course, there was a theory that tried to get around that, but very few of, of the really great socialist leaders and theorists actually came from the working class. So that's a, you know, that's a problem that I think was there even in early Marxist theory and practice. And I think in the 21st century, it's not just that class politics have been a failure. It's that we've lost a coherent notion of class, period. And that's okay with me, you know, because I would no more want to reduce someone to their class background than I would to their race or their gender, okay? Um, when I say that I'm a socialist, um, it's not very well known anymore, but there's a wonderful, um, was one of the founders of the German Social Democratic Party, Edward Bernstein, um, who was actually way ahead on, on all kinds of issues, um, including gay rights. He happened to be exiled in London when, uh, during Oscar Wilde's trial, so he became, you know, open to that. He was very good about women. Um, you know, lots of issues that only came up later. Um, there were people thinking about them in the late 19th and early 20th century. But um, for me, being a socialist means acknowledging that there are social rights as, in, as well as political rights. So all the things that liberals consider to be benefits or privileges, healthcare, education, um, decent housing, um, you know, all kinds of labor rights that, at least on the continent, we sort of take for granted. Even when we have conservative governments, everybody assumes that people get paid vacations and parental leave and all of that stuff. Those aren't privileges. Those are rights. And they're actually codified in the UN Declaration on Human Rights that was published in 1948. So um, for me to believe that those are rights that we can gradually move towards um, is to be a socialist. So I think it's not, I mean, yes, um, you know, it's, it's the disintegration of class politics and strong labor parties and labor unions, but it's also the general despair that uh, people have been feeling with good reason in the last six or so years. It's very interesting, the word woke did not come up in the 2016 U.S. election. It will be the main word in the 2024 election. Now, what happened there? I've tried to imagine what would have happened in 2016 if Bernie Sanders had won the election, which was a live possibility, okay? Um, and I don't want to be too America-centric, uh, but... Unfortunately, we saw that the rise of Donald Trump gave aid and comfort to the right all over the world, from Boris Johnson and Brexit to, uh, you know, uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary to uh, Netanyahu in Israel to Modi in uh, India. I mean, all of these are uh, Bolsonaro. You know, all of these are people who unfortunately said. Uh, you know, if the president of the United States can do this, I guess I can and get away with it. I guess I can do it, too. Um, had Bernie Sanders won that election? I'm not the world's greatest fan of Bernie Sanders in terms of his, you know, he's he's not terribly charismatic. He's not, uh, you know, I think he doesn't. There's a lot of things that he could know more about, but he mobilized millions of young people because, you know, he's talking about basic social democratic justice. But had he followed on the, I mean, just let's imagine a historical counterfactual. Um, a lot of people on the left tend to be cynical these days about Barack Obama. Um, I've lived long enough and I grew up in the American South to know that um, his becoming president and that black family living in the White House for eight years uh, with an incredible sense of integrity and intelligence and cool um, doesn't, you know, was a major step for progress. 
Now, just imagine that that um, Barack Obama had been followed by the old Jewish Bernie Sanders, who was a deep social democrat. You would have had a sense. We all would have had a sense that, in the words of Martin Luther King, that uh, Obama liked to quote. Uh, the arc of history was leaning towards justice, okay? Um, And instead of that, especially for people who grew up at a time when uh, Obama's becoming president wasn't an achievement, it was just normal, okay? That must have been the deepest sense of... um, you know, disappointment and despair. I mean, I certainly felt it too. And I, you know, I'm uh, older that, um, I, I can understand feeling progress is not an option. Any step forward is indeed going to result in two or 10 steps back. You know, this is basically a point of Michel Foucault. Um, And the only thing that we can change, if we can change anything, is our language. That's been, um, you know, I I really see a lot of features of the woke as the result of despair, not just about class politics, but about the state of the world in general, and in particular, the turn from some signs of hope on the horizon in various places – to signs of, you know, reaction, if not fascism. I think sometimes one needs to call it by its proper name. That sense that they feel that the world they can change is shrinking all the time, or rather because the world feels out of control to them, the things they focus on trying to change get smaller and smaller. So language is one example, as you say. I think part of the transgender ideology probably springs from this too, where where the body itself becomes the only site of radical overhaul, the only thing over which you have real meaningful control, and everything while everything else around you is is going completely crazy. And so I do think there's this kind of narrowing of 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 what they want to impact on and what they want to transform. And in, I wanted to ask you about that in relation to the sense of um, doom and fatalism, because one of the big sections in your book on why the left is not woke, and you've mentioned it already, is this culture of cynicism, this culture of doom, this sense that things can't really be changed. And in relation to that, I did want to ask you about the race question. There's a few parts in the book. You talk about Black Lives Matter. You argue that it started out as as a universalist movement, and then it was depicted by people on the right as identitary and it was dismissed as identity politics. Just to start off on this, I wanted to ask you, to what extent was it really a universalist movement? I mean, it it made a huge global impact, but it did strike me that that was possibly and ironically a kind of almost soft power neo-colonialism where you had this uh, American movement um, sponsored or supported by American capitalism to a large extent, particularly the social media oligarchs, which was then the only means through which people in Belgium or Nigeria or Australia felt that they could stake their political claims and make their voices heard. So Black Lives Matter became a banner for all sorts of different movements. Was that a, a real form of universalism or, or was that what you refer to elsewhere in the book as, as phony universalism, a kind of globalism that's driven by corporate interests rather than uh, radical political interests? No, I don't think it was initially driven by corporate interests at all, although corporations did very quickly jump on the bandwagon. That was a real popular movement. And there have been studies done in the U.S. that close to 60% of the people who were on the streets identified as, as we say, um, as white, okay? And that's very important that you saw, you know, white policemen kneeling on the street, that you saw white veterans, um, you know, in uniform defending black protesters. And let's not forget, this was in the beginning of a pandemic to for which there was absolutely no vaccination. So people were actually risking something to go out on the streets. Uh, I, for example, didn't um, because I'm older. I have, um, I, I was more vulnerable uh, 
during the pandemic, I donated a, for uh, a, quite a long time. I donated all my honoraria to the Black Lives Matter bail fund. My kids were on the streets, but um, that's as far as the U.S. It was, uh, it, you know, there were over twenty million people uh, out there, and not only once out there. And more of them were white than were black, you know. And it was it it was a it was a deep revulsion at this video that everybody saw. Mm. Um, I mean, I wouldn't call it neo colonialism. What I think happened, and initially I thought it was quite moving. Um, people in Belgium were finally thinking about uh, you know King Leopold in the Congo. And the statues of him that were all over him. It was one of the more brutal colonial uh, wars, uh, you you know, that ever took place. And it's quite clear that Belgium got rich on it. If you look at, um, you know, the buildings in Brussels and, um, you know, so, so, you know, the people in Britain. In 2019, I was struck by the fact that The Guardian did a poll uh, asking whether they thought that anything was wrong with the British Empire. And there were only 19% of people the Guardian polled thought that there was anything wrong or anything to be ashamed of um, about the British Empire. I think it did start out as a genuinely universalist movement in the way the civil rights movement was. I mean, people were just simply disgusted uh, all over the world by pictures of uh, police dogs being set on children or water cannons or whatever. Um, It switched. And I think the first switch did come from the right saying that this was, um, you know, identity politics and that all lives matter. And of course, all lives do matter, but that's a banal truth. And it was being used to obscure uh, a deeper empirical truth that the lives of of uh, black people are generally less valued than the lives of white people. So, you know, it was the right that first began calling it an identitarian movement and pushing back. But then the leaders of Black Lives Matter took that on themselves to also go in a direction that was much more identity focused with the caveat that white people could be allies. And I object to the word ally uh, because, you know, if you're an ally, you may share common interests with somebody Um and you may share them for a while and then change if your interest change. But it's not a matter of common conviction. It's not a matter of deep solidarity. And uh, I think it's a dangerous word to use. It's certainly not a word that was used before in, um, you know, in various kinds of left-wing struggles. It wasn't used in the labor movement. It wasn't used in the... You know, socialist movement wasn't used in the civil rights movement either. Yeah, I think the, the the part in your book where you talk about the the issues you have with the idea of allyship uh, really rung true. And if you think back to earlier progressive movements, people were called comrades, or in the uh, the, the the Black Panther movement, you would have been brother or sister. Uh, there was, of course, talk of solidarity. It was a much more profound sense of connection, where, as you say, allyship is seems to be a much flimsier contingent thing, which I think is very, very interesting. I want to just mention, because I, I know you come from an Irish family, and I have a great, I'm not Irish, but I have a great uh, affection for Ireland, and I spend a lot of time there, um, mostly in the town where Daniel O'Connell was born, known as the Liberator. And what appeals to me about Daniel O'Connell so much is the way in which he immediately took up the fight against American racism, against uh, colonialism. I mean, it was, of course, you know, he was fighting for civil rights for the Irish, but he absolutely saw that as connected. Uh, and then they called him, well, when, when uh, 
he hosted Frederick Douglass when he came to Ireland and people called him the Black O'Connell. And then, you know, <laughs> then uh, then people began calling uh, O'Connell the, the, the Irish Douglass. So, you know, it, it's that sort of and then we're, we're talking about the, you know, the early 19th century. It's that kind of solidarity that we're missing and that the woke are doing their best to undermine, even if they think that it's OK, you know, you can be an ally. Um, but, but, but it's a very different, uh, very different concept. Yeah, absolutely. And we saw a repetition of that kind of Irish black solidarity in the late 1960s as well with the Northern Ireland civil rights movement, which made many connections with the black civil rights movement in the US. You had someone like Bernadette Devlin, for example, going from Northern Ireland to uh, uh, meet with Black Panthers and civil rights activists and getting in a lot of trouble for doing so, but thinking that it was worth doing precisely for the reasons you're talking about, which is that solidarity and common convictions used to count for an awful lot in progressive movements. Um, but, but I wanted to ask you about something quite different to those things, which is um, victimhood, the politics of victimhood. There's a there's some very powerful sections in your book about one of the key components of woke, which is the valorization of the victim. There's this really interesting sentence very early on in your book where you say, can woke be defined it begins with concern for marginalized persons and ends by reducing each to the prism of her marginalization. And then later on, you go on to talk about uh, how uh, the victim is the political player in the 21st century and, and what that does to a sense of agency, a sense of ambition, a sense of camaraderie, all those things that are uh, are founded in confidence rather than victimhood. How important and problematic do you think the valorization of the victim is in this kind of politics? Well, I think it's so problematic that I'm writing another book called Heroism in the Age of Victimhood. Um, and I was actually um, planning to work on the finish that. Um, and then I was asked to write this book based on a talk I gave, and it just seemed like this book was urgent and I would do it first. But it's not something that the woke invented. It's something that happened, the valorization of the victim or the changing of, you know, throughout history. Um, history has been written by the victors, which means that you, what you've had is a heroic account of history. And the victims were forgotten by and large, okay? Um, sometime around the middle of the 20th century, that changed. And, of course, initially, it was an act of justice. Let us hear the victims' stories. Let us not forget that, um, you know, they were there even if they couldn't be saved, that their stories matter, that they should be cared for if possible. All of that seemed like a great idea, um, along with deconstructing certain traditional military notions uh, of heroism, okay? But it came to the point, and this is where we are now, that, um, you know, victimhood itself is the fundamental part of people's identity. The reason why race and gender are being prioritized as the two things that people can do the least about, it's also the two ways in which they're more likely to be traumatized than not. And if we want to get a sense of how much our thinking on this score has changed, uh, we can look to one of my very favorite writers, uh, jean Marie, um, not so well known in English as he should be, uh, but this is somebody who was a, uh, imprisoned for two years at Auschwitz and survived. He was arrested uh, as a member of the resistance and sent to Auschwitz, and he survived and wrote the most searing account of what that was like that I've ever read. But And then went on after the war to write a number of um, brilliant things, including strong defenses of the Enlightenment, despite everything. But Amory wrote that being a victim is not an honor. He did not even think that there should be memorials to people who had been victims of the Holocaust. Okay, He thought you had to 
do something in the world. So I'm not suggesting that we go back to erasing the victims, but I am suggesting that we go back to the point uh, at which caring for the victim is, uh, is a virtue, okay? Taking care of victims is a virtue, seeing if one can uh, redress the wrongs that they've suffered. But being a victim itself is, is not a source of virtue at all. It's just something that happens to you. And in prioritizing our victim identities, we're prioritizing, again, the, the, the worst thing that ever happened to us. And that's quite scary. Um, but I just did a test because I was reading about, uh, I read a good article on um, many of these questions, and uh, which referred to an intersectionality test. An intersectionality looked to me as, you know, as if when you first read about it, um, you know, simply pointing to the fairly obvious point that I, uh, you know, emphasize which is that we all have different identities. But it's not about that. It's about we all have, or many people have, different victim identities. So this, there's a, you can look it up. <laughs> you can test your victimhood status. I got moderately privileged, but not very privileged. I guess it's because I'm a woman. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Are you looking to get into journalism? Are you passionate about Spike's pro-freedom, pro-democracy politics? Then we've got the internship program for you. Spiked is offering paid placements for six months for aspiring writers, editors, podcasters, and video makers. You have until the 16th of June to apply. Successful applicants will start work in July in Spike's offices right here in London. Find out more about the internship program and how to apply by visiting spiked-online.com slash interns. That's spiked-online.com slash interns. It's, it, uh, I think the, um, it is extraordinary. And, and the, the parts of your book where you, you refer to Jean Amory and um, his reluctance even to have monuments to victims of the Third Reich, as you say, because he said, look, being a victim, there's no honor in that. It's not something he, he, he was interested in. You also talk about Todd Gitlin and um, his book, Letters to a Young Activist. And there's some really interesting material in there as well. And he made the, he, he talked about the profound impotence of a leftish politics or a pseudo left politics. I don't know how we would refer to it. That is more concerned with one's victim identity rather than with what one might do in the world through conviction through connection through um political aspiration and i was interested in that idea of profound impotence and and just i just wanted to ask you what impact you think that has on politics more broadly because if there is now this new politics that is that emphasizes or valorizes victimhood suffering um what happens to you rather than what you do so i guess what it means is that people become objects of history rather than subjects of history so history is something that is done to us rather than something we do ourselves and i wonder what impact you think that has on i guess not just on political life that's a bit too narrow but on our sense of ourselves as a human race if we if we start to see history as this oppressive force that shapes us and molds us rather than as something we ourselves make through making decisions and taking action. Doesn't that change the entire nature of history and the entire nature of our relationship with it? Yes, I think it does. I think it's extremely disturbing. And, um, you know, it's, it's uh, I think you're right, it both changes our sense of ourselves and one sees all of these cases of people... Um, straining to find a victim identification, in some cases faking a victim identification. Um, but e even apart from that, which is troubling in itself, supposing you really are, look, there's still quite a lot of sexism in the world, and I experience it, you know, um, still as, as an adult. But um, one 
can choose how much of one's attention one wants to give to that. Okay. Um, I think uh, a friend of mine said to me a long time ago, you you know, why don't you talk more about feminism or, you know, all of the still existing uh, sexism towards women? And I said, you know, I I, I don't actually find it useful. Um, I I find that it emphasizes the wrong kinds of emotions in me. um, And, you know, prevents me often from just going ahead and doing the work that I want to do, all right? Um, I'm not saying it should never be addressed. It, sh- it should be addressed. But I, th- I think that um, spending too much time on the victimhood that may genuinely be there in a person's life, depending on what um, you know, what identities are, are prioritized. Um, I don't think it's good for the soul actually. Um, and I don't think it's good for whatever sense of commons we might share and, and build. And indeed I have heard people from, you know, who are much more part of sort of woke political circles than I am, that there winds up being a kind of victim competition, um, you know, that is, you know, splitting or undermining a number of groups. And and that just seems like, a, a, you know, once again, defining oneself according to the worst things that ever happened to one seems not like the way to go. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, Susan, okay, just two more questions for you before I let you go. The first is on something I disagreed with in the book. And then the second, the last one is on something on which I agree with you very much. So the first one is, I want to ask you about the right and particularly about the populist right. And um, the only part of the book that bristled with me to a certain extent was there's parts of the book where you argue that the 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 new right or the populist right or the nationalist right is more dangerous than the woke, more dangerous than some of these problematic ideologies you've just been explaining in very articulately there. Um, I, I mean, I don't want to get into an, a discussion about who's worse than the other, unless you want to, of course, but I, I did want to press you to see if you can, if you can understand why those kinds of right-wing movements are taking off? Because to me, it seems entirely logical that in Europe, for example, many, many working-class people are turning away from social democratic parties and are now voting for parties of the populist right. Um, We had Brexit here in the UK, which you've mentioned. And in fact, the idea of leaving the European Union was traditionally a left-wing idea. If you go back to the 1970s and the 1980s, It was left-wing grandees of the Labour Party, notably uh, Tony Benn, Barbara Castle. They were the people who were making the case to leave the European Union on the basis that the EU is basically a capitalist club. It's a neoliberal club. It it undermines national democracy and so on. Um, But do you not think that in relation to who's worse than the other, the, the, the more pressing point is that it's precisely the elite's embrace of woke and technocracy and the phony internationalism, which is actually globalism that you mentioned in the book. It's all those things and the transformation of social democratic parties into machines of the graduate elites, essentially, that has pushed the working classes to look for other voices that might represent what they consider to be their class interests or their political interests. So isn't the rise of the populist right an understandable reaction to the degradations of woke? Uh, no, because it started much earlier. Okay, it, it, it really did, um, and uh, certainly it's the case that um, you know a, a alienation from the woke has increased a different form of tribalism, right? Um, namely, well, if you know, if if the elites get to get to do their form of tribalism, why can't you know white? Hungarians or um, uh, French people or Brits uh, do the same thing. But 
um, it, it started considerably before there was a woke movement. And of course, global neoliberalism failed the working class, um, you know, and, and many ways, of course, it's also failing the planet, um, which is another point. But look, um, when I say that the right is, is more dangerous, they kill people. <laughs> the woke are not killing people right now, okay? Um, and I'm thinking um, about the United States where, you know, we have a pre-Civil War uh, state of affairs right now. I mean, even in Congress, okay? So um, they've, you know, there have been mass murders, there are militias, there are people killing people, Okay. Uh, there are Hindus killing Muslims in India, okay, um, very, very much supported by a, a right-wing nationalist government, okay, racist nationalist government. And I don't know whether you follow uh, Israeli politics at all, but what has been happening in the state of Israel is uh, – Actually, you, you know, it's very right-wing, um, right-wing uh, religious fanatics at the moment, but it also has some interesting elements of woke politics because um, any time the Israeli government is, is criticized, there is a tendency to uh, – the, the government will immediately say, oh, you're all anti-Semites, we have no reason to listen to you, okay? Um you know, but but interestingly enough, Modi does very similar things with post-colonial theory. Um, you know, saying "Don't talk to me about human rights." Uh, look at what the Europeans did in colonializing us; they violated our rights. Um, so, uh, you know, so so it's a it's a combination of nationalism, tribalism. Um, with this appeal to earlier states of victimhood, um, that's actually lethal. Uh, and these are people who have, or I mean, Putin, why am I leaving out Putin as a piece of this? You know, Putin is using woke, um, but the tendencies were there before anyone was, was talking about it. So um, they have more power and importantly, they have more weapons. I think, yes. Uh, I think what's one thing that will be interesting in the coming years, I think, is the relationship between the politics of victimhood and new forms of violence. And I think we're seeing that in Europe in different ways as well. I think the Islamist violence we've had in Europe, for example, over the past few years, particularly 2014 to 2017, 2018, in which hundreds upon hundreds of people were killed, I think I see that very much as a, 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 a violent manifestation off the politics of victimhood, the politics of particularism. And I do often wonder if there will be more expressions of that in the years to come. So I, I think the, the possibility that the woke sensibility in the sense of forcing people into themselves to into a world of self-pity and a world of offence taking, I do think that has the potential at some point to spill over into violent acts. But we'll see how that progresses. But the, the, the last thing... I wanted to ask you, which is something on which I could not agree with you more. You write about this at length in, in Left Is Not Woke, and you've written about it before in your, your other works, including all the stuff you write about Kant and the need for people to grow up and, and how to be a mature person in an infantile world, all those things you've been writing about for a long time. You write about the importance of defending enlightenment values, and there's loads of good stuff about that in Left Is Not Woke. There's a really good section which I, uh, which was quite eye-opening for me in terms of giving me a new understanding of the enlightenment, where you just make the very simple point that the idea that the enlightenment was full of writers and thinkers who were naive and panglossian is complete nonsense because they were making the tough argument for progress on a continent that had been ravaged by plague, by disease, by war, by death. So this was a tough case that they were making for reason and progress as the ways forward for, for humanity. Um, so just say a little bit, if you don't mind, about why you think Enlightenment values are important to defend and what you think might be the key ones that we should start thinking about as we move forward. Sure. Um, and you're right. This has been a theme running through um, a number of my books. What I 
didn't discuss in the book, in the, the longest book, uh, Moral Clarity, in which I talk about um, the Enlightenment at some length, I did not discuss the charge that the Enlightenment was the source of Eurocentrism, racism, and colonialism, because when I heard that charge about 15 years ago, I thought it was so silly that it was going to disappear. Um, unfortunately, it didn't. I was wrong about that. And so that's my focus in this book. I don't um, go into um, it, at length into things that I've talked about before. Um, it's a charge that not only misunderstands the Enlightenment, it just turns it upside down. The Enlightenment was the movement that came up with the idea of universalism in the first place, the idea that um, one notion of rights applied to people, whatever their religion, whatever their class, and uh, without it, uh, we would not have the tools to fight against colonialism or against sexism or against racism or against slavery. But not only did they provide the fundamental foundations for that at a time when it was really um, a quite radical thing to do, but they also wrote specifically some of the strongest condemnations of colonialism and of slavery that anybody ever wrote and it's you know it it uh, it's beyond me how people could miss those things. When I was writing this, I I, I had the idea of trying to take a passage of uh, Diderot, who is uh, urging the indigenous peoples of South Africa to murder the intruders of the Dutch East India Company, uh, and not to believe a word they say, but just to kill them. <laughs> and I, I thought I could transpose sentences of this with, uh, with sentences from Franz Fanon, and you would actually think that Diderot is more radical than Fanon, who's a big hero of the post-colonial theorists, but is often, I think, misread by them because he was more universalist than, than he's given credit for. Um, but then the problem was it was that, that uh, Diderot was saying, well, you know, let fly your poisoned arrows. So that's a dead giveaway that this is the 18th century and not the 20th. Uh, but in fact, there are all kinds of texts from Enlightenment authors uh, condemning colonialism um, and condemning Eurocentrism. And they're the first people to argue we need to look at the world from other geographical perspectives. We need also to look at Europe from other geographical perspectives. Um, and some of them were threatened with death for arguing this. This is not, you know, a shitstorm on Twitter. I mean, these are people who stood up for the idea that, you know, the Chinese should be taken seriously even though they weren't Christian, right? And that was something that you could be sentenced to death for in Prussia in the early 18th century. So, uh, yeah, so that's, um, I, I mean, the, the, the first and perhaps most important uh, Enlightenment ide ideal that we owe to the Enlightenment is um, that every human being has a fundamental dignity that should not be uh, damaged or destroyed or taken away. Um, the idea that reason and arguments are uh, something that we're all capable of and that it's a much better way to, um, you know, reach conclusions than appealing to our tribal origins um, or appealing to some kind of authority. Once again, we forget that, um, you know, reason was being opposed not to nature, but to fake ideas of what was natural. And in the 18th century, uh, you know, the oppression of women, the existence of slavery, feudal hierarchies, and most forms of illness were uh, considered to be natural. Um, so it's not, as is sometimes said today, it's not opposing reason to nature. It's... Um, questioning what certain religious or political orders claim is natural and saying, look, everybody has 
potentially the same capacity to use their own reason to think for themselves and to um, question the apparently natural. And I suppose the final one is the is is the notion of progress. Um, you know that before the Enlightenment, you had sort of cyclical theories of history. You mostly had the idea that if there was going to be any real change in human life, it was going to happen after you died. <laughs> and, um, you know, the idea that human beings working together could make real change in their own and other people's condition is an idea that we owe to the Enlightenment. It's not the idea that progress was necessary. As you, as you said, and as I emphasize, um, you know, these people were not uh, sunny, you know, they, they wrote more about evil than any other, uh, certainly than any other philosophers uh, in history. So, you know, they knew that uh, there wasn't a, you know, a, a natural tendency towards progress, but they thought if you worked really hard, you might be able to make some. <laughs> so. Susan Nyman, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, Brendan. Thank you.